Yeah, I think we can admit everyone now. Let me admit. Okay, uh, so uh, let's get started. Thank you for joining this session of the virtual seminars in economic theory. This is our last session for the for this academic year. Uh, but we're planning to continue uh, for next year as well, as long as there is demand and it seems that there is uh, participation. So we want to thank you for this. So this uh, today we have uh, Scott Duke Commoners, who is going to talk to us about uh, his paper To Infinity and Beyond, Scaling Economic Theories via Logical Compactness with uh, Yanai Gonzarowski and Ron Schorer. And we're very pleased to also have our guest panelists, uh, Ben Brooks and uh, Fujito Kojima. The format of these seminars is as follows. We have a 60 minute uh, uh, presentation with time for interim questions from the, from the panelists. Uh, we encourage the audience to participate. Please post comments and questions in the chat. There will be an opportunity to ask questions live in the Q&A session at the end. Uh, you can also unmute yourself and ask questions during the talk if, uh, uh, if you want. The talk is uh, recorded. And uh, the talk is also broadcasted in the virtual chair academic metaverse. Uh, so the link is going to be posted uh, in the Zoom chat in a few moments. After the Q&A session, we will switch to the virtual chair for a few minutes to chat uh, informally. And we will meet in the seminar room. And uh, if you have a Chrome browser, that's the best uh, to use. Uh, so uh, that's all for me. And I'm very happy to have Scott to finish our academic uh, seminars for this year. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you everyone for tuning in. Um, you know, thank you for Hudo and Ben for, for serving as, as commentators and, and uh, you know, sort of collaborators throughout. Um, and then, you know, sort of especially I should, you know, thank and acknowledge my, my co-authors, Yanai and Ron, uh, you know, just, you know, as you guys are, you know, as everyone's keeping track, um, I'm the one presenting the paper today, but the vast majority of the credit in some Shapley value sense should be apportioned to the two of them. Like, uh, you know, this paper could never have happened without either of them in some like very strong emphatic sense and could definitely have happened without me. So when you're adding up all the marginal, co you know, sort of contributions across the sub-coalitions, like, you know, please give a ton of credit to uh, Yanai and Ron, uh, both of whom are totally extraordinary. And it's a, it's a real pleasure to have been able to work with them on going to infinity and beyond. So as the title suggests, this is a paper about infinity, um, which admittedly is a, a slightly unusual thing to be writing about, but, but bear with me and I'll, I'll try and convince you that, that we should really care about it. Um, but let me just quickly sort of remind everyone here that we often make finiteness assumptions in our, in our models. We assume a finite set of agents, a finite time horizon, a finite data set and in decision theory, like whatever the context, you know, finiteness makes the analysis easier somehow uh, in many, many contexts. Sometimes we like infinity for smoothness and the things it brings, but like especially in the market designing worlds that, that I work in most frequently, finiteness really often is a useful simplifying assumption. And yet, despite the fact that it's a simplifying assumption, it, it, it's sort of not a without loss simplifying assumption in the sense that it does play a real role in the analysis. Like often you have a theorem the, the argument for which really concretely and, and specifically depends on finiteness. Uh, and sometimes it's even essential in the sense that like the, the result itself is relying on some edge effect or, or, or finiteness of some form. And even when we can get away from finiteness, we often find ourselves doing this via some very, very different methodological approach. Um, you know, this is, you know, this happened throughout classical game theory and, and sort of early existence theorems and things like that. Also happens much more recently, um, you know, the existence of stable matchings, there's a, you know, a, a very simple constructive argument, uh, you know, sort of in finite markets due to Gale and Shapley. Um, when Fleiner first brought us to infinite models, uh, it relied on like a completely different, um, you know, sort of, morally similar, right? It's, it's, it's sort of conceptually like what's going on is similar, but, but practically and analytically, it's like a very different approach. It relies on Tarski's theorem and, and even in a different way from a lot of the, the Tarski theorem arguments that we see now. 
I had to cite, I had to include this, this incredible image that the, uh, the BSET team uh, produced. Um, you know, very, very Star Wars, but like, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna sort of take this, these finite models and today sort of introduce like a, a new hope, a unified user-friendly method for lifting these finite model results to infinite models uh, based on a, a core theorem of propositional logic called logical compactness. And I promise I'll, I'll define what that is very soon. But before we do that, I have to make good on a different promise, which is on slide one, I said, I'm gonna try and make the case that we actually care about infinity, right? Because the world is actually finite. And so, you know, most things we think about in the world, you know, even, even if you're like doing Walrasian equilibrium pricing or something like the, you know, the number, you know, go down to an increment of a penny, like at some level, like finiteness seems like it should be the, the real case. And so one might think that infinity is just abstract nonsense. Uh, but at least my, my co-authors and I believe, and, and I, you know, you probably have seen sort of intuitions for this in other parts of economic theory as well, that infinity actually often sort of tells us something that we think of as more like conceptually right, right? So if a, a model, the result in a model holds for an infinite set of agents, we sort of think of that somehow as being more robust or canonical, we often think of it as also being less susceptible to frictions, right? If you think, you know, it sort of relies on an edge effect, um, you know, that's a cutoff of like the last agent in a system, you know, if we perturb the market by like adding new agents or something of the sort, we're not, it's not totally clear whether that like sort of cutoff effect is real and, you know, sort of will, will work anymore. And so somehow like we often move to infinite models when we're thinking about limits or, or markets where there might be uncertainty about participation or something. Uh, in the context of time horizons, and this has been a you know, sort of popular framework in, in dynamic games for decades, and we've now even started to see like you know, sort of two-sided infinite horizons. Um, and the idea here is that a game that has neither start nor end is you know, maybe a better way of thinking about a dynamic steady state, right? That it somehow tells us something about um, what the you know sort of what the game really sort of would be like if people kept playing it in in steady state rather than you know for example like inducting from from the end stage or the or the first stage especially if the first stage uh, I'll show you an example later where we're looking at a school choice model where the the standard argument for a, a finite sort of past horizon uses the day zero allocation of students to schools to induct forward but like you know, in some sense, the the equilibrium assignment of students to schools really doesn't feel like it like started on on a you know on a fixed day. I and mean, I guess there is a point at which like all the schools opened or something. But but in in reasoning about what's going on in the market, it doesn't feel like we should be induct or to me at least, it doesn't feel like we should be like declaring there a first day and inducting forward. Rather, we should be asking sort of like what do things look like with sort of the past and you know in in the, in the mirror and, and and the future sort of in the you know in the crystal ball. And then lastly, um, and I put this example last, although I actually think it's one of the, the strongest cases for infinity, uh, is in the context of decision theory, we often like to theorize about being given an infinite data set, um, you know, sort of effectively like observations of all possible choice behaviors given some choice set or something of the sort. And the reason for that is it tells us about the inherent limitations in the nature of observations, it sort of tells us like the boundaries of what we could ever observe. And, and sometimes that's different actually from like what you would get if you sort of did the same analysis on all finite data sets. Um, and so like with the infinite set of agent story, it's about sort of being more canonical somehow, more, more like really getting to the core of the question of like, what can we or can we not hope to observe or rather hope to infer. Scott, may I ask yes. a question Please. or make a comment? Good. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I, was, I, was about to, I was just realizing I should pause here and let people talk because this, this is actually like an important case to make. Go for it, Ben. Don't encourage me too much. Um, <laughs> I would thought you would have also said that we look at infinite models because they're simpler. I mean, it's actually kind of the opposite of what you said earlier in the mm. talk, that we look at finite models because they're simple. Sometimes we look at infinite models because they're simple. And it's kind of related, I think, to your bullets one and two, 
that it might be that going to an infinite model allows you to make the model symmetric or self-similar mm -hmm. in a way that makes the analysis more tractable. Or it might be that going to an infinite model allows you to use tools like calculus that are not available in a finite model. Absolutely. Could you comment on that? Sure. Uh, I totally agree. So often the infinite models are in fact simpler. The context I'm going to be talking about today, and, and, I, and I agree and appreciate that and, and, and do it a lot in my own work, right? Like, you know, uh, indeed, like a lot of, a lot of my work with, uh, you know, Muhammad and Piotr that, that builds on some of the uh, approaches you've, you yourself have introduced, like, like we're using infinity, like a continuum model very directly because it makes the sort of problem smooth and lets us like look at the distribution rather than the individual outcomes. In all the contexts I'm going to talk about today, it's the finite model that in one fashion or another, at least to our, the best of our understanding, appears to be simpler. Um, and I guess, I guess there are probably like, you know, it's not out of the question that there are contexts where the infinite model is simpler, but methodologically still, you know, sort of the, the, anal the, the analytic approach changes a lot. And our approach would let you sort of like reason using the same analytic approach. Um, but mostly we're going to be interested today in cases where the infinite model is, is not by nature easier to work with. And indeed, like some of the structure of the finite model breaks down in the infinite case. And yet we're still going to be able to think about the infinite model and, and we're going to do it by appeal to sort of properties of the finite model and this compactness theorem. So, so I'm, I'm, it's sort of complementary to the cases where the infinite model is simpler. Um, these are sort of cases where the infinite model is, is less structured, but we might think is, is for different reasons, is more complete. Does that help? Cool. Further questions on this slide? Going once, twice. All right, sold. So uh, I'll, give a, I'll give a more formal uh, definition in a moment, but but loosely, what is this like logical compactness idea that's going to underpin all of our approaches today? The idea is that formal logic is compact in the topological sense. Um, and what that means is that a set of logical statements is going to be able to be made true simultaneously if and only if every finite subset can. But again, in, in about two slides, I'll, I'll, I'll state this formally. But the idea is going to be that we're going to be translating various economic theory um, ideas, uh, you know, and, and, and frameworks, not just the idea, You're translating, you know, existing economic theory frameworks into sets of logical statements, such that the infinite, you know, sort of model corresponds to an infinite set of statements, but we'll then be using these sort of like finite subset projections and then and using the compactness theorem to extend the result from finite models to the infinite. A bonus about doing this, uh, and this I was just hinting to Ben, is that if we do this type of analysis, compactness is actually gonna let us reason about the models in their regular language, instead of thinking about limiting processes or convergence or other things we normally do to get to the infinite model. Uh, compactness is sort of gonna like embed all of that like limiting type structure somewhere, somewhere inside the topology of logic, and instead let us like just ask questions of the, the baseline models. Um, and so, you know, I'm going to prove some theorems in, in matching theory, and I'm going to be proving infinite sort of market matching theory results using just the, the classical language of matching theory plus this like logical embedding. Uh, then I'm going to prove some results in decision theory, and it'll, it'll be the same. Um, the, uh, ah. This one actually maybe. Ron, if you can like, you know, so, so Arthur asks, can you comment on, on the relation of logical compactness to topological compactness? It's a, it's a compactness in a particular topology. Uh, Ron, maybe if you can like pull a, a link to Yanai's notes on this or something, because uh, th th this is actually like a, a good use of the chat system. We can, uh, we can sort of sure. fill in some of the details and send references directly. Um, uh, cool. All right. So what are we going to do today? Uh, we're going to introduce propositional logic 101. I'm just going to like sort of set out the, the formal framework for propositional logic. Then we're going to spend uh, most of the talk, probably, um, I don't know, two thirds of the remaining time or so, um, the, uh, you know, thinking about matching in infinite markets. Uh, we'll do a warm up where we do the existence of stable outcomes. Um, and then, uh, you know, sort of we'll, we'll go from there to structural and centered results. Uh, and then, Sort of the end of that section, I'm going to prove a result for um, for couples matching. Sort of lifting 
and this is this is sort of an interesting proof of concept. I'm going to take a like you know a rounding result for for couple you know approximate equilibria and couples matching, approximately stable outcomes and couples matching, and lift that to to infinite markets in a way that like relies on very little structure of the original uh, argument, just to sort of show like how you know generally applicable these techniques are. Uh, then we'll do sort of a, a whirlwind roundup at the end of other settings. I'll talk very briefly about stable matchings with tenure and while raising equilibrium and infinite trading networks. And then at the end, um, you know, hopefully prove one and a half results about rationalizable choice, maybe two if we, if we have enough bandwidth. Um, so any questions about the roadmap? Um, at some point, it would also be great if you could comment on the connection to like Zorn's lemma and transfinite induction and, uh, you know, other results that people may be familiar with for uh, extending finite solutions to infinite solutions. That's a good question. Um, I mean, at some level, these are all related because logical compactness is a consequence of Tikhonov's theorem. I don't... Um, I think that if you uh, if you want to be very very uh, formal, then uh, logical compactness in, is weaker than the axiom of choice. But I don't think you know this is what we're trying to achieve here. So for for us, this is just a tool that is somehow way way more unified and accessible uh, and uses this simpler language. I think, but mathematically, it's also a weaker requirement. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. And, and I was going to say, is like, I don't know, I don't have a good sense of how substitutable these different types of tools are. Right. So like, I don't, I don't have a, a, a formula for, or, a, you know, a, a gadget for transforming a like Zorn's lemma argument into a logical compactness argument or vice versa. Um, we've just found this particular tool to be very flexible and versatile. Um, but I don't have a sense of like how, but it, it would be very nice to have like sort of a, you know, like a, a, an embedding or reduction from like sort of one class of these tools to another. Um, but but it's, it, it's at least not clear to me intuitively how to do that yet. Um, it's a great question though, actually. I wonder, Ben, we should talk about this offline. Like, I, I wonder if there actually would be a way to build such a gadget. Um, well, you know, Zorn's lemma in particular comes to mind. You know, I could construct a sequence of finite solutions yeah. that are sort of getting larger and larger. And yeah, it's uh, true. Zorn's lemma would tell me that there is a maximal solution that uh, nests all of the ones that uh, I've constructed for finite subsets of my data, for example. It's, it's true. What we're doing here is going to be more, the reason I don't know whether there's a, a correspondence is what we're doing here is actually even a little more existential than that. So like, we're not going to get a, a nested structure. Um, we're sort of going to get to the existence in the infinite market just by virtue of the existence in the finite markets, but not necessarily in relation to those the, the solutions of the finite markets. Um, but it, it seems plausible to me that because of that, one could one could write the other direction of the correspondence that like basically a, a Zorn's lemma argument in these types of spaces could could potentially embed into a you know sort of be be sort of reduced to a compactness argument. But I'm not sure. Um, it's a great question, actually. It's a bit, it's a, I, I, we've gotten versions of this, like, you know, how do we, to what extent can we relate the, the finite market object to the infinite market object before? But I haven't thought about actually like trying to do it using one of these other, like, you know, set theoretic constructs. It's a really good question. Hmm. Cool. Thanks. Um, what's going on in the infinite? Ha, love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the for the the, the commentary on, on infinity and abstract nonsense in the chat. This is great. Um, all right, so propositional logic. Uh, so the baseline object in a in a propositional logic setup is a set of boolean variables. These are these are just boolean variables. They can be true or false. But uh, you know, for our first example, I'm going to use matched MW as my boolean variables. And those matched MW, naturally, as we're going to guess, are going to turn out to represent whether man M and woman W are matched in some, you know, associated matching model. But for now, these are just Boolean variables. We then in inductively construct this the set of formulae off of these Boolean variables. So the atomic formulae are just the variables. And then for each formula, we add a not that formula, and then a you know a, a join meet implies and an if and only if. Uh, 
And note that like, so this is inductively constructed, right? So we're sort of like, you know, so we're starting with some set of formula, you know, variables and then taking, you know, all of their not that variable, all of their join, all of their meet, and then we take them through sort of all subsets of, of one or two of these inputs. Um, but each individual formula is going to be finite, right? So we have this potentially massive infinite set because in particular, I haven't required that the set of variables be finite or of any specific cardinality. Uh, and then I'm doing all of these combinations and constructions off of them. But because this process is inductive, each element of the set of formulae is going to be finite. So example formulae. Here we have matched MW implies not matched MW prime. That of course naturally also sounds like a specific, um, you know, uh, you know, specific matching concept, which indeed, uh, you know, if M and W are matched, then M and W prime are not matched. That's like one to oneness on the man, the men's side. But here it's written as a logical formula. And again, right now it's just an abstract Boolean formula, right? I've given it semantic meaning by telling you it has something to do with the matching model potentially. But right now it's just a, a set of formulae that they could have a sort of natural, like a set of uh, a formula that can have a natural truth or false value, depending on whether I, I set it up correctly or not. A model is just an assignment of variables to different Boolean values. And the truth value of a formula is defined inductively, right? So, you know, if, uh, you know, if matched MW prime is true, then not and matched MW prime is false, for example. Uh, you know, or, or similarly here, you know, if this formula has, you know, matched MW true and uh, matched MW prime false, then this formula will also, um, yeah, then yeah, we can sort of, uh, sorry, Simul right. A sat set of truth values will simultaneously satisfy that formula if I set matched MW true and, and not matched MW to be, sorry, matched MW prime to be false. Sorry, getting tongue tied in my primes or not. You can also satisfy this, of course, if we like, you know, don't have matched MW true in the first place. And now we can formally state log. Actually, let me quickly pause there. Any questions about the this formula construction? Cool. Uh, can I All ask right. something? Please. Uh, Scott, uh, so do you, uh, I guess you don't allow infinite uh, formulas, right? Correct. Uh, we do not allow infinite formula. There's, the set of formulae is, is infinite, potentially very, very infinite, but the individual formulae are finite. So for example, could you, for example, uh, have like, suppose I want to express that something is common knowledge, for example, and I would need, let's say, an infinite formula. Would you be able to express this in the language? Or uh... Good question. My, I don't know off the top of my head. My guess is you could maybe express it with a family of formulae that are sort of in increasing size, right? It's like the, the I know, you know, I know, you know, I know, you know. So like all of these individually, I, I have to think about how to write it out. This is actually a great question. We haven't, we haven't tried to do this, um, but I think you could maybe express that with an infinite family of formulae that together express every level of the hierarchy. And common knowledge is the fact that like throughout that hierarchy, you're, you're covered, but I'm, I'm not totally certain. But you could not write a single formula that would express the concept of common knowledge unless you had some way of reducing it to some you know, sort of finite set of statements, or finite statement, rather. And can I ask a, another question, Scott? Please. So uh, am I correct that in propositional logic, there's no existential quantifier? So I yes. can't write a statement like for every M, there exists a W such that matched correct. MW is true. That's exactly the next comment I was going to make. So there's no for all and there's no there exists. So I can't make sure that everybody is matched. Well, uh, in, right. You can't make sure that everybody is matched. That 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 syllogism doesn't follow. So it, it's not that you can't make sure everybody is matched simply because you don't have a you know there exists or something. But specifying that everybody is matched, you know, you would somehow have to you know take a, a union of of infinitely uh, you know many elements or something of the sort. Um, so, so yeah, so because you don't have this quantifier, you end up having to specify something like that in a language that, that wouldn't give, give them finite statements. Cool. All right, so now we can formally state logical compactness. A set of formulae is gonna be satisfiable 
uh, I can use my exists quantifier in, in definitions. Um, there, that is, there exists a model in which, uh, you know, a sort of assignment of the variables for which all of the formulae are true, if and only if every finite subset is satisfiable. So this just says, if I give you a potentially infinite set of formulae, I can find, you know, sort of Boolean assignments for all of the variables so that they're all the formulae are consistent, if and only if I can find such assignments for each finite subset. And now here's where we get to this like Zorn's lemma question. There's no, there's no implied relation between the solutions for the finite subsets and the, the solution for the infinite set. It's, it's purely existential. There are solutions and therefore there, there exists a solution for the infinite set. Um, cool. Questions there. We'll see it in action in a moment. Cool, all right. So, Classical two-sided matching model, set of men M, set of women W. Uh, preferences now, uh, just to, to because these sets might be infinite, um, we're going to uh, you know represent preferences as a list of nth choice partners for each agent. So instead of like sort of usually the way we, we normally represent this is uh, you know like in a in a preference relation here it's it's like a ranked list um, that could itself be infinite. Uh, matching is a one-to-one -one match mapping between men and women, and a you know matching is blocked. Um, uh, great question, Steve. Uh, I'll come to it in a second. A matching is blocked by M and W if M and W reach and refer each other to their assigned match partners, and it's stable if it's not blocked. Uh, and and we'll, we're we're sort of embedding the the individual rationality in that definition, but the but fine. Um, we're going to also only match people to people they find acceptable. Um, Gale and Shapley's 1962 theorem is that stable matchings exist in finite markets. We don't normally add the finite quantifier here, but, but it's important for this context. Because note, I set up M and W so that they could in fact be infinite. And to Steve's question, um, they, um, these sets do not need to be countable per se, but as you'll see, as we sort of go through these arguments, they're sort of like the agents are gonna have mass in a way that in like a typical uncountable set, like, you know, when we, when we like normally like find ourselves in, in continuum models and things, the agents don't have mass. Here, the agents are gonna keep their mass even in sort of like the, you know, sort of like large market limits. Um, uh, in the sense that like, for example, a strategic manipulation by an agent will still have an, an impact on the allocation potentially uh, in a way that it would not in a, in a continuum model or typically not in a continuum model. Um, but, but otherwise, in a lot of these other contexts we talk about, we're going to have to impose sort of like local finiteness conditions that sort of make the thing appear like kind of locally, you know, locally countable or, or, or sort of like locally scoped in a way that's going to make the finite projections uh, actually finite. Um, so, so it's not formally countable, but it's going to have a lot of the sort of things where, that, are, that are sort of the properties that are intuitive from countable models. Great question, Steve. Um, further questions? Um, just clarification. So when Please. you say the preferences are, are N choice partners, do you mean that uh, N uh, is uh, non-negative or uh, do you- Ah, yes, sorry, very important. So there's the yes, yes, yes. these are natural numbers. Um, ah, so okay. so, so there, even there, it's gonna be important that there's a top choice. Okay, you um, still- And note that the stable matching problem is actually like not super well-defined if people's preference lists go on infinitely in both directions. You actually need like a, a, a top choice in order to so you're saying that the, if we have uh, these um, uh, infinite choices both ways, uh, positive and negative, then do you get a uh, basically non-existence? Is, is that a problem or? Um... Yeah, it's not even totally clear. Like you can sort of have this problem where where blocks you can you sort of construct blocks arbitrarily out to infinity just by like adding new agents that everyone prefers more than their their current top match. So like for any match, yeah. I can assign like a new set of agents that everyone prefers. Um, and so okay, yeah, it, I'm, I'm kind of guessing that maybe, yeah. So I, I was just checking that the, this is uh, this assumption is out of the necessity for your proof. Or it's actually kind of like more uh, sort of like as tight as po 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 sort of weaker possible in a sense. So. Yeah. No. Exactly. It's 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 like a it's a conceptual uh, it's a conceptual restriction as addition to in addition to one that's relevant for the argument. Totally. Okay. Good. Thank you. Um. Cool. All right. So. Half an hour in. Thank you for bearing with me with like a you know a much longer warm up and setup than I typically do in my talks. I promise we'll we'll get faster from now. Um, but let's like start by proving a theorem. So 
Fleiner in 2003 showed the first version of stable matchings for infinite markets. Um, it's a really impressive argument. It's also a really hard argument. Um, you know, it's, uh, the Flyer 2003 paper is one of these ones where, like, every time I go back to it, I discover I like didn't completely understand it. And I have to reread it and like relearn it. Um, the uh, let me try and prove this theorem on a single slide. So let's stick with those variables we had before, matched MW. Uh, now, really, we are going to think of these as corresponding to some like to this matching model we set up. So for every M in M and W in W, we're going to introduce a variable called matched MW, which you guessed it is going to be true if M and W are matched and false otherwise. So that first formula we used as an experiment, matched MW implies not matched MW prime. So if you know, we've matched M to W, then we better not match M to W prime. That's one to one this on the men's side. Similarly, on the women's side, you know, one to one this if matched MW, then not matched M prime W. And note, we have these for alls over here, but these are just like, you know, filling up our set of formulae. So the formulae are finite, even though we have potentially very large infinite sets of them. We'll also add not M matched MW for M and W who are not mutually ranked. So if M doesn't rank W or W doesn't rank M, then we're not going to match them to each other. That's an individual rationality constraint. And then one more formula. So we have this, this blocking constraint. So if not matched MW, then we had better have matched MW1 or you know, all the way to matched MWL or matched M1W all the way to matched MKW for, you know, for some W1 through WL or M1 through MK that they prefer to, you know, that they prefer to each other. So if we didn't match M or W, then at least one of M or W has a partner they prefer. And now note, these might be very large formulae, like, you know, this, you know, MK, you know, sort of K could be the like 7,000th person on, uh, you know, on W's preference list. But this formula is still finite. And this is where we're using that, like, you know, sort of start at the top of the list that Fujito and I were just talking about, that we need to be able to sort of like, you know, count down from your top preference to whoever else we might match you with. And now note that this is a set of logical statements. Again, like the Boolean variables have no sort of like formal, like they, they're just Boolean variables. There's no like formal semantic meaning. But if I can find a set of truth values that satisfy all these uh, formulae simultaneously, then by matching the M and W whose matched MW variables are true, I get a stable matching. And how do I know that? Well, it's one to one because otherwise we'd have a violation of one of these formulae. It's individually rational, or otherwise we'd have a violation of one of these formulae. And it's unblocked, or we'd have a violation of at least one of these formulae. So let me um, pause there for a second, because like this is this is an important like conceptual leap. Do we like does everyone like you know agree with me that if I can find a set of truth values that satisfy all of these formulae, then uh, you know there is a then I can find a stable matching. Cool, I've got a thumbs up from Ben. Fujito, are you happy to? Awesome, we got a thumbs up for Ben and Fujito. We're going to call that. <laughs> ben, you have, I a also have a question. Um, Great, what's so, your question? So I'm guessing that you can't encode the statement that everybody prefers to be matched with someone to not to be matched with no one. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering if uh, Fleiner has the same issue. So in Fleiner's model, can uh, do you get the existence of a stable match where you know, like everybody is matched with someone? I don't know the answer is you definitely we definitely don't have a good way to encode preference relative to being unmatched. I don't know whether Fleiner has that issue or not. Um, that is in general something that is very difficult to encode in stable matching frameworks. Um, I mean, at a finite market, you can just rank everybody, of course. but but adding constraints on sort of the size of the matching tend to be hard. I don't know. That's a great question. I do not know off the top of my head. Um, and I will try and figure that out. Um, huh, super interesting. It's certainly not like native in any of these models that represent matching via a preference ranking, but I don't know whether Fleiner's method could cover that, even so. Fujito, do you know at the top of your head? No, it's super interesting, no. right? 
<laughs> okay, cool. I don't know the answer. It's a great question. Um, the, uh, yeah, exactly. Steve's saying this is like a restriction on preferences. Exactly. Like, I don't know whether the Tarski type methods can cover that type of restriction on preferences. Um, maybe. I don't know. Okay. Uh, but okay, so we, where, we, where, we, where we last left off, um, if we can find a solution to all of these, a simultaneous uh, you know, sort of solution for all of these formulae, then we have a stable match. Uh, and then in the other direction, if we have a stable match, then note that we can find a set of solutions for these truth values uh, just by like, you know, marking true every Boolean variable for M and W who are matched, right? You know, stable match satisfies one-to-oneness, uh, you know, individual rationality and unblockedness so in particular, we can satisfy the corresponding logical constraints. Okay, we're done. So where's the, what, what was that last step that I just sort of like, you know, waved my hands and said, great, we're, we're, we're over. The last step is, Note all of those correspondences are true whether the matching framework is finite or infinite, whether the set of formulae is, 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 is a subset or not. So I have this set of formulae covering my potentially infinite matching model. I take any finite subset. Well, those name a, you know, a, a set of men and women, you know, a subset of the total set of men and women. And those sets are finite because the formulae are finite, right? If I like add up like all the men and women across all of those set, you know, all of those formulae, I get a finite set because I have a bunch of finite formulae which name finitely many men and women. So now we can interpret that finite subset as a set of like a subset of the constraints of a stable matching problem for that new finite set of men and women we just you know, sort of aggregated together. And we know they have a stable matching because of Gail Shapley. And so in particular, like we can satisfy the, stable, the stability logic constraints for that finite model. So any finite subset of these formulae I give you corresponds to, you know, you know is, is part of the stable matching constraints for some finite model. Gail Shapley gives me a stable matching in that finite model. So in particular, I can satisfy those constraints then compactness tells me I can satisfy the full set of formulae as well. And so what's kind of beautiful about this approach to me at least is that you know, writing this logical formulation is actually like non-trivial, but we haven't really used very much machinery, right? Like at, at some level, all we did was translate matching into this logical language and then apply Gale Shapley in the finite models. That's kind of like you know magical. Like we're you know no limits, no no uh, no convergence arguments. We're just sort of like using the finite models plus this this abstract um, you know uh, topological structure. Questions there? Uh, I just have one question on uh, please. We, we, so if I, if I understood it correctly, this finiteness is is applied to a finite set of formulas. Is it correct or but but then. I mean, it could involve some, some formula might involve some say M1 and another formula might involve M2, so, so, but you can always perhaps find a large enough finite market so that Gold Shapley does the job or? Yeah, exactly. So if some of the formula involve M1 and some of them involve M2 and some of them involve W7, then we take the market that contains M1, M2 yeah, and W7, all of those agents together and use Gail Shapley. And then Gail Shapley is gonna satisfy the full set of, of constraints in that market. And so in particular, it satisfies all these like individual sub constraints we, we use to construct it. Cool. So maybe this would be a good time to come back to the motivation for studying infinite models uh, that you gave in the introduction and kind of yeah. talk about that motivation in the context of the matching model. Like, what do you, how do you, um, what, what do you feel like we've learned about? Let me actually, let me, let me defer that until I present the next result for matching. Is this one I think we haven't learned, like, you know, sort of, we, first of all, we, we've reproven an existing theorem, but we haven't learned like about the structure of the limit model. This is more like a demo of how the tech works. Let me use this to prove a new theorem about strategy proofness and matching, and I'll, and I'll tell you what I think it taught us. Cool. Awesome. Cool. So. As I mentioned, we just reproved stable matching in infinite markets. Um, it turns out you can actually also prove the existence of non-optimal stable matchings in infinite markets, which is, which is not as immediate as what I just showed. Um, it's going to actually look sort of like the argument I'm about to present. Um, 
But the first sort of like new thing we're going to do today is prove the strategy purpose of man optimal stable mechanisms in infinite markets. So, so the first of those results is like, you know, existence. The, the first result we proved is existence. The second one is existence. This one is very much not. It's seen, or at least it seems on its face very far from an existence result because what we're really doing is, is proving something about mechanisms in this context. And Ben, now to your question, I can already preview, uh, as I mentioned, you know, in, in response to Steve's question earlier, in these limit markets, uh, the agents are going to maintain their mass. So strategic manipulations will still move the outcome potentially, or att you know, attempting to, to manipulate will, will still you know, potentially change the outcome. Uh, we're going to show that strategy proofness holds nevertheless. This is sort of a, a canonical result from finite markets. Um, but the interesting thing is the typical finite market arguments for strategy proofness rely on a version of what's called the lone wolf theorem. Uh, it's, a, it's a version of the, or the rural hospitals theorem. Uh, which is not true in these infinite market contexts. And so in some sense, the strategy proof this result is going to be more robust than the core result that's used to prove it. Um, and so to me, at least, this makes the strategy proof this result feel much more canonical than, than I would have thought it was ex ante, especially having learned that the result that drives strategy proof this in the finite market actually does not extend. But it turns out that's about the structure and configuration of the matching. The strategy proof this result is much more about how manipulations move around matching space. So, right, finite version, uh, you know, in any you know, if matching market, the man optimal, then any finite matching market, the man optimal stable matching mechanism is strategy proof for the men. We're going to lift that to any possibly infinite matching market. And how are we going to prove this? So here, the argument is more complex than what we saw before. It's going to require bouncing back and forth a little bit between sort of thinking about the, the logical, the, the infinite market and the finite market. So it's going to start in a place that's going to be very familiar to those of you who've proven strategy proofness results in, in matching markets before. Because like, you know, typically the way we get at these strategy proofness results is by sort of trying to reduce to, you know, a, a case in which you know, if you manipulate to match with a given woman, you can match at least as well by reporting truthfully. And in particular, we showed that you can, without loss of generality, you just replace, you know, uh, you know, instead of whatever manipulation you did, you can replace it by just naming W tilde. So if I can manipulate to match with W tilde, uh, then I get, you know, I do at least as well by reporting truthfully. This is our claim. Uh, so let's imagine instead that M tilde, you know, submits W tilde is preferred to nothing. We'll call that outcome mu. We're going to use those same formulae we had before, and we're going to add in one more, which is just this do it, you know, M tilde does at least as well by reporting truthfully. So, um, or rather, by, you know, sort of does at least as well as matching with W tilde. The truthful part will come later. So, this is just, you know, for all, uh, or, you know, the union, again, and this is a finite formula because there's a top preference, you know, sort of for all the, uh, the women weakly preferred to W tilde, M tilde is matched to one of them. So now, again, like before, you know, sort of ball up any finite set of formula you want. By compactness, we're going to be trying to do something with, uh, you know, sort of to show that they're all satisfied. Um, so a finite set of formulae mention M prime. Uh, oh, and, and sorry, and, and note. Sorry, one more, one more thing before I before I move on. What does this formula mean? This means that in the original market. M tilde does at least as well as W tilde, right? So if we can satisfy all of these together, then we've, we've got our claim. M tilde is going to do at least as well under his true preferences in the original market. So now, finite set of formulae. Uh, we ball them all up together. They match in, mention some men, some women. Uh, but we're not just going to look at the, the market comprised of those men and women. We're actually going to look at the market that contains those men and women, and M tilde, and W tilde, and all of their partners under mu. So we're sort of, we're, we're using now this like manipulated market. We're going to like look at the projection involving this manipulated market. And I claim that in this manipulated market, or this sort of like projected market, whatever we want to call it, uh, the man optimal stable matching with respect to M tilde's true preferences satisfies the finite subset of statements. So to start with, if I didn't take this new statement, then it's just a stable matching and we know we can satisfy it. That was the argument we just did. So the only interesting case is where we're picking up this new statement as well. And we have to make sure that M tilde, 
excuse me, it does at least as well in this market as matching to W tilde. Okay, well, first of all, uh, the restriction of mu had better be stable in this market if M tilde submits W tilde as preferred to, to nothing or to the empty set, because in this context, M tilde had better match with W tilde. Moreover, right, in, in mu, M tilde is matched to W tilde. So, uh, you know, we know that M tilde can achieve W tilde if he submits these preferences. But now if he submits these preferences, then that had better be his outcome under the man optimal stable matching as well, right? There's some stable matching where he matches to W tilde. So in particular, under these preferences, the man optimal stable matching is better matching to W tilde. Okay, fine. So we're in the finite market. We know that Gail Shapley is strategy proof in finite markets. And so in particular, we can use the version of this lemma in finite markets. We know that if M, til if M tilde tells his true preferences to the mechanism, he's going to get some partner he weakly prefers to W tilde. Ha ha, there's our statement. We're done. And you're shaking your heads. You're shaking your head, brother. Um, I missed something. So first of all, what, what does the empty set mean here? Oh, sorry. This is just the, the null matching. So, so you're, you're saying that the only woman I find acceptable is W tilde. I see. So you're, you're truncating, you're, you're heavily truncating your preferences. Okay. And then another, I, I didn't understand in point three, what you mean mm -hmm. by the restriction of mu is stable. Ah, I mean, is the Good. claim that, uh, that mu restricted to this market is a stable match? Yes, that's and exactly that's the claim. I see. We were basically wiping out a lot of stability constraints. And the only thing we would be worried about is uh, you know, what happens to M tilde. But we know that M tilde is matched to W tilde in mu. So, so we haven't changed anything, you know, sort of anything about the, 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 the stability of the, of the underlying matching. Good. I see. OK. And this factor uh, being uh, that the uh, mu, mu restriction is stable is uh, simply because you just took a uh, subset of uh, agents. So yes, exactly. We took a subset of the agents, so we can't introduce any new stability uh, constraints. So here we had to think a little bit about like how like what this market is, but the the core concept is the same. We're, sure, we're somehow using the result in the finite case to characterize, you know, sort of, you know, sort of to characterize and, and, and then obtain a solution to these, uh, you know, to these subsets of the full set of constraints or the full set of logical statements. Uh, and then again, by compactness, we get to sort of lift that directly. And note again, all the reasoning here is in the language of matching, right? We have to like identify, we're using the, the logical formulae to identify like which set of agents we wanna be looking at and so forth. But, but this, this slide could be on, you know, sort of an ordinary matching talk board, um, you know, with a, with a lemma that says W does at least as well, um, sorry, M tilde does at least as well as W tilde, matching with W tilde. And as I said before, like we've proven strategy proofness here, but the, Typically, to prove strategy proof, is we use the lone wolf theorem. Uh, this shows that the lone wolf theorem is more brittle than strategy proofness because we know it fails in infinite markets sort of catastrophically. Um, you know, versions of that argument due to Ravi, you know, sort of uh, earliest one, I think, due to Ravi Chakadisan. Um, and so somehow, like the strategy proofness result, even though like in finite markets, we think of it as being a context of the structure result, it isn't like it, it sort of, it, it, it's somehow more robust than that. It's like, it, it's not just a consequence of the structure, but rather the structure like elucidates that it happens or something. Okay, so that's what sort of the, the set of like core matching results we proved in this paper. Um, a, a student of mine who's now, who's just finished her freshman year of college and proved this stuff while she was a high schooler. And I, I don't mean, uh, you know, to say like, you know, you know, logical compactness is so accessible that a high schooler could use it uh, because Yun So Choi is, is like, you know, the most extraordinary, like, you know, unbelievable student on the planet. Um, but so 
while in high school, a, a student of mine, Yinso Choi, proved versions of group strategy proof disrespect for improvements and the classical entry comparative static in infinite markets using this machinery. She also showed, by the way, that just like the lone wolf theorem fails, weak Pareto optimality also fails in these infinite markets. So it is really non-trivial, like, like not all of these things lift and, and the arguments to, to lift some of them are much more subtle than others. Uh, let me just quickly whirlwind through one more matching application, and then I'll do a really quick whirlwind of these other applications just to sort of give you a sense of what else we can achieve in this space. Um, but so couples matching, you know, we know in the National Resident Matching Program, couples can submit preference lists jointly. Uh, blocking coalitions can be a single doctor in a hospital or, or you know, two hospitals, um, you know, uh, you know, a couple in two hospitals or a couple in a single hospital with two positions. Uh, and we know that like, you know, sort of stable outcomes are very much not guaranteed, even in sort of simple markets with uh, responsive preferences. But Nguyen and Vora recently proved this beautiful result that said you could sort of perturb every hospital's capacity a little bit to find a stable matching. So, and, and methodologically, this is, this is very different. Uh, it uses Scarf's lemma, sort of doesn't live in any of this like Tarski machinery space that we know of. Um, and yet, compactness is going to apply almost exactly like in the warm-up. Um, and so how is this going to work? Well, we've got our variables matched DH as before. Now doctors and hospitals are going to need a new set of variables called capacity. And this is going to be HK. Capacity HK means hospital H has capacity K. The formula, we're going to add this perturbation to the capacity, plus or minus two. There's a, there's a finite formula that says the capacity of H is within two of its actual capacity. And then similarly, the capacity is well-defined. And then all of our matching constraints, you know, with the addition of like matching can't break capacity and so forth. Blocking also can't break capacities. You get the idea. And then we're done. That's literally it. We supplement the existing matching framework with these capacity objects. And the thing that might have seemed like it would be really hard to encode logically is this idea that the capacity perturbs by plus or minus two. But in fact, if you introduce a set of variables that are capacities, that's one of the easiest things to encode. And it's kind of wacky, right? Like now, like before the formula, we're all just true, false, like who's matched with whom. Now some of them are true, false, who's matched with whom. And other ones are true, false, is hospital H's capacity equal to K or not? The real key is you have to be able to encode the constraints of stable matching, or whatever the like matching problem you have here. And we'll see it again in these other contexts in a moment. You have to encode the constraints of the problem into this logical language. But again, once you do that, like it's actually sort of surprisingly easy in, in many of these cases to reason about. So Sorry, once again, that's a, e please go for um, it. So once again, so this is a case in with uh, infinitely many uh, participants. Uh, yes, exactly. This is infinitely many participants with finite each each hospital having finite capacity. Okay. Okay. I see. And uh, and again, so uh, Q is the capacity of uh, uh, H. Uh, uh, yeah, and in, in there, so technically, so the, the capacity a, of H in the, so, the theorem is K sub H. And okay, Q here okay. is going to be a free variable across capacities, and we're going to let it go between KH minus two and KH plus two. Uh, okay, that's how you, you read it. Okay, good, good. Thank you. So in the, e, can, can you go back to the e, Indian Vora uh, theorem? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to remember. A statement. Uh, okay, I see. So, uh, I see. So, uh, my recollection is that the Indian Bora also has additional restriction on this change in case, uh, namely the total number of like. Yep. Change, uh, <laughs> I was I was literally about to speak to that. So you'll note we do not include this restriction on the total perturbation here, and the reason is that like involves adding up across all the hospitals. And so we don't know how okay. to do that, so embed that in this language. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> good, okay. good spotting. Sorry, you, 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 and, and perfect preview. And I promise I wasn't going to like, you know, totally shove it under the rug, but I was indeed like. <laughs> see, I see. I see. There's a reason indeed that you can shove it under the rug for that slide. That, um, uh, that indeed. So, so this argument works because we're looking at a perturbation at the individual hospital. And so we can have in, in, infinitely many hospitals that perturb by a finite amount. But this, like you know, whole market thing requires aggregating over the entire market, and we don't have a way to encode that. 
I see. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Great question. Um, what was the? Uh, that was one of the two things I was going to comment on. Um, oh, right. The other thing that's kind of interesting about this um, that again is very sort of oblivious to the the proof method. You might have imagined that in a limit market, that constant two would change to something else. Right, that like you know, sort of as the market gets bigger, like you have to do like more perturbation somehow. And indeed, in the aggregate, maybe you do. We don't know. Um, you know, per Fujito's question, but um, because it's an absolute constant in the theorem, and we're just like referencing the theorem in a finite market, like in that finite market, the perturbation is at most two. So in the infinite market, the perturbation is at most two as well. All right. So that's our you know sort of existence of couple mass, couples matchings with finitely perturbed capacities. Fujito keeping me honest on the on the, the full market perturbation. Um, let me just quickly a question. May I go five minutes over the? I know we're supposed to like be at the hour. We've doing been doing lots of discussions. So can I go to uh, you know sort of what is hour plus five instead of the hour on the mark? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yes. Fabulous. Okay, cool. So uh, we're still going to pick and choose. I'm going to I'm going to mostly do like you know some of the revealed preferency stuff at the end. But just very quickly. Uh, as I mentioned, we can sort of also turn some finite, you know, past horizon models into infinite past horizon models. So Penadaya has this really elegant paper about stable matchings with tenure. Um, but the idea, you know, sort of the, the paper relies crucially on there being sort of a, a day zero at which, you know, sort of you then induct from, you're sort of like updating the, the match in each period based on the previous period's match starting from a baseline match we can show that the baseline match is, is totally unnecessary in some sense. Um, even though like, you know, you can't sort of solve backwards from a fixed, you know, sort of time, you can use compactness, pick any finite subset of statements. You know, the, you know, the, there's an earliest time mentioned in any of those statements and then you can invoke Penadaya's theorem there and, and or, or induct forward from there to prove existence in, in the finite market or the finite past sub market. Blech. And as a result, we get the, the infinite past horizon for free. Uh, similarly, we can use this in, in context with some continuous structures, right? So everything we've talked about so far is fully discrete. Um, but if, for example, we wanted to work in the you know, infinite trading network model, um, you, can, you can express, you know, so expressing continuous prices requires infinite formula, as we've seen before. We can't even like integrate over like a complete, like a, an infinite finite sim. But we can look at approximate equilibria within a finite price grid, right? And, and just like we did with capacities, now we can introduce variables that are like price, price, price. You know, it's a one of these and only one of these is the price. And then similarly, you have to impose that like, you know, sort of for each object that's available in the market, one agent or the other, you know, so the buyer or the seller ends up with it. Um, we need a local finiteness condition. This is, I mentioned before, like we sort of, we need still that these individuals sort of like the scope of the things an agent might be in, engaging in trade with is, is a finite set. So that when we project down, you know, and then, and then look at every agent involved, we have a, we have a finite market in the first place. But Hatfield, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the five author paper gives us equilibrium and continuous prices for every finite market. We can hilariously go from that, you know, true equilibrium to a rounded equilibrium that satisfies our, our approximating statements. And then we can lift it back up, find an approximate equilibrium for every price grid, and then take epsilon to zero. So it's also possible to implement some, some continuous structure in this way. And then last, as I promised, we have this whole sort of other half of the paper that really looks at these decision theoretic structures. Um, we give a, a, a new proof of Rennie's uh, you know, generalization of Afrayat's theorem to infinite data sets. Uh, and then we do you know, sort of four different um, you know, sort of variations on, on the theme of taking sort of you know, classic or, or, or recent decision theory results and, and lifting them to infinite markets. Um, Stochastic choice, Alan McFadden Richter, rational inattention, Alec Kaplan Dean, filtered attention, uh, Master Leoglu et, et al., random attention, uh, Cataneo et al. Um, and you know, in the, in the, the last five minutes that are that are technically over time, I'm not going to have time to like really go into a lot of detail about this, but let me just quickly give you some intuition for how it's going to work. So, so if you'll bear with me, doing a thing that I would I would forbid any one of my uh, my students from ever doing, I'm going to like set up a new model in the last five in the negative five minutes of the talk. 
but but trust me, we'll 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 get there. And this is this is like you know I hope gonna like really convince everyone that they want to like go out and like use uh, you know logical compactness all the time. So choice data pairs x s x is chosen from the menu s. Question is is it rationalizable? Uh, that is is can we find a preference such that the most preferred available option is always chosen? Uh, you know choice is revealed. You know if uh, you know sort of x is referred to y for all y and s. And then weak axiom of real, real preference, of course, is that there are no cycles that are revealed in this framework. So I'm not going to prove one of the one of the hard, um, you know, more general decision theoretic results. But let me just prove. I have no idea how to pronounce this uh, Spillrines uh, theorem. So this is a data set is rationalizable if and only if it satisfies warp. Equivalently, every strict partial order can be extended to a total order. And this again, it's going to look very much like that warm up we did for matching. And in, in the paper, we, we frame it as another warm up exercise. Um, so now we're going to institute formulae over the variables that define this preference relation. So GTAB is going to be A is preferred to B. And this could be true or false, right? Like, you know, but we're going to need like, you know, sort of a, a set of these GTs that satisfy all the right conditions. So either a, B, G, T, A, B, or B, A. So, so it's, a, uh, it's an order, you know, it's a total order. If G, T, A, B, then not G, T, B, A. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, if, if A is preferred to B, then B is not preferred to A. Um, it's transitive, G, T, A, B, and G, T, B, C implies G, T, A, C. And then finally for our data set, now we have to like, you know, sort of, Ask you know for all uh, you know for all s that a that's chosen in our data over some b that's in the associated uh, you know sort of candidate set a had better be preferred to b. Pactus tells us that all we need to get our, our theorem is to do this for every finite set of formulae, and again we're just going to be totally done from there, right? Take any finite subset of formulae. This is going to give rise to a strict partial order on a finite set. We can extend it to a total order. Like it's just as immediate as our existence of stable matches. Just in a totally different like language space, right? Here the Boolean variables are like encoding the preference relation that we're working with. So apologies for doing that in two minutes, but but hopefully, like even if even if you didn't rock the, the the full sequence, like you can you can feel intuitively that we're doing the same type of argument, um, and this really should like hopefully convince you that this is really really context agnostic, right? This compactness result much more is it just about being able to. Um, uh, oh, Steve asked, is there any reason for the new notation? Yeah, the reason for this is just to emphasize that they're Boolean variables rather than. Um, you know, the objects from the semantic model where they're interpreted as orders. And that distinction is actually important, right? Like the logic is just about these Boolean variables. Uh, and then we apply semantic meaning. We say, oh, hey, note these constraints like are in direct correspondence with a, with a you know, ordering. Um, cool. All right. So. You can do a version of that exact same game. For example, for this uh, this generalization of limited attention rationalizability, we are not going to go over this right now. But I'm flashing the slide for a moment on the on the video. So if somebody wants to like stop and see a generalization of the Mastelioglu at all, uh, you know, sort of warp LA condition um, equivalence to uh, limited attention rationalizability, uh, it is here. Um, also in a version of the, you know, updated version of the paper coming soon. This is, I think, not in the one that is currently posted, but should be posted very, very soon. Um, very much the same argument. So it's a, you know, see, even though some of those formulae are the same. Um, but okay, so, whoop, that didn't work. Sorry, that took us way back to the, back to the future. Um, I was supposed to take us to the conclusion slide, but instead took us to the title slide. Uh, we probably don't want to watch the entire talk again, um, but let me let me just zoom us through. You can pause at other bits of this. Um, so now we've shown that you can get from like finite models to infinite models in a whole bunch of different contexts, right? Like matching, you know, these these trading networks with even continuous prices, decision theory, and in all of these contexts, there's this like unified approach based on logical compactness. Um, 
we argued at the beginning that this, that like this infinity is actually meaningful, right? It sort of gives us more coherent models of dynamic steady states. It teaches us about robustness of results like strategy proofness, which now we can say precisely, you know, this idea that strategy proofness is true, you know, relative to lone wolf. Um, and it also, and again, we, we talked about this for all of, you know, negative four minutes in the talk, uh, but it lets us understand the inherent limits on inference from data sets, right? That like, what can you do with, you know, sort of all possible, you know, data rather than just finite sort of observations. And crucially, like just as far as making this like useful and practical across a range of different economic theory contexts, it's a black box re reduction, right? Where we're reasoning about models in their regular language instead of, you know, sort of limiting processes or other convergence or things that we normally associate with infinite models. Uh, and so at least for us, we, you know, you know, <laughs> I can't speak for my co-authors, but I am terrible at topology and, and limiting arguments and things. And yet, you know, sort of being able to, and so being able to like work in these frames, uh, you know, it simplifies the analysis to me intellectually uh, tremendously. Uh, but, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. The real takeaway is that, you know, game theory itself, you know, uh, is logical. QED, thanks so much. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. Um, so maybe before I open the questions to everyone, if uh, uh, Ben has a comment first and then Fugito. Sure, I'll make I'll make a comment. Um, first of all, that is really cool and and a very nice set of results and very clearly presented. Um, I feel like I want you guys to sharpen a bit more the message about what we learn from going from finite models to infinite models. Um, you know, I'm not sure actually whether I learn more from the strategy proofness result than from the stability result, you know, in terms of what is, uh, what conclusions from a finite model are, are robust. Um, let me make an, a, a, an attempt quickly uh, at, uh, you know, presenting what I think would be a more satisfying uh, conceptual takeaway. So, you know, you didn't get to talk about this much in the talk, but in the paper, you talk a lot about Afriot's theorem and Rennie's uh, generalization to infinite data sets. Um, you know, so Afriot would say, well, um, if I have a, a finite data set that satisfies, it satisfies GARP, if and only if I can rationalize it with quasi-concave continuous uh, utility. Um, now you might worry that for any given utility function that I use to rationalize a finite data set, maybe I add more data and now that utility mm, now it breaks. no longer works. Yep. Okay? Maybe that's true for every utility function. So in that sense, you know, the utility functions that I, that I try to use to rationalize the data are, are not going to be uh, robust to adding more data. So what do you learn from an infinite extension of Afriot's theorem? Well, you learn that for any finite data set, actually there is some quasi-concave utility that I could use to rationalize the data and would still rationalize it even in the presence of, of more data on consumer behavior. Um, importantly, you don't get that for continuous, right? Every continuous utility function that I use to rationalize the data I could add more data in a way that's going to sort of ruin that utility function or, or make it so that utility function doesn't rationalize the data because the continuity part of Afriot does not generalize to infinite data sets. So I suspect that you could do something similar with the stability application. Say like, you know, I have a, a, a small market, I have a stable match in that market, or there's a set of stable matches. I wanna know, would this particular matching continue to be part of a stable matching if I add more agents? Of course, the answer is if I add a small number of additional agents, maybe not, but then I could always add more agents so that actually the, the matching that I started with would still be stable. So it's sort of, you know, that, that's a, a very loose uh, attempt to sharpen uh, the takeaway about, you know, whether or not a particular solution in a finite model uh, yep. is going to still be part of the solution when I make the model bigger. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, super interesting. Again, it's not always the case that we're going to have like traction on the link between a particular solution and, and the limit solution. But I think even without this, the, the particular solution part of what you said, it still makes a lot of sense, right? Like 
um, you know, you wonder, okay, fine. Uh, I can get a stable matching in this market where I, I know that agents are not incentivized to manipulate in this market, but like, as I start adding agents, like, does that start to break down, right? Do I get sort of away from that? You know, do I get away from stability? Do I get away from like, you know, sort of the, the structure that we, we have present? Um, and I agree, like if there were a way to loop in the like, to what extent does this market, you know, is this solution rather remain a solution or like remain near a solution that would be even more powerful. Super, yeah, totally. Thank you. Super interesting. Thank you, uh, Fujito. Uh, yeah, so firstly, uh, uh, thank you for the great talk. So uh, let me be brief. So uh, I have a quick, um, question about this uh, interpretation of infinite markets in this context matching. So um, so we, we had some discussion earlier, but uh, I wonder if there's any way to think of this uh, infinite uh, agent market as something like a model in which there are potential set of uh, people who could be in, in the market. So, um, you know, that uh, mm -hmm. oftentimes in some models with viable population, we consider like an infinite number of people uh, but if they, uh, but we tend to choose a finite subset of it uh, as uh, any variation. So I, I do not have any any particular uh, uh, idea about how to interpret it this way when it comes to stable matching. But I was thinking, well, I'm wondering if such a thing is possible. Um, another one, the, another comment is that uh, somewhat related to again the main theme of this. But so. Um, the so as a user of this method, I guess. Um, so I'm still feeling the. Uh, I, I I feel. I find it to be very intriguing that some results like existence and uh, you know stylish proofness um uh generalize the infinite market, but not this long roof theorem and others. So yeah. I wonder if there's some way at least to see if uh, for what kind of problem uh, you can expect uh, this logic um, um, to, to be applicable. So what kind of statement is it applicable? So uh, you, you kind of touch, uh, touched on it, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'd am i like to- That's a great question. Uh, Scott, can I jump in? Please uh, go for it. So like we don't have a formal uh, characterization, but you'll note that all three examples that Scott gave Pareto efficiency, uh, rural hospital theorem, and now I forget uh, <laughs> what was the third one. Uh, oh, a uh, 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 choice uh, result mm. involve, uh, and in some sense, the, the one you noticed uh, about the uh, Vora's result involve a statement about all agents. So Pareto yeah. improvement means everybody is involved. So those are things that you will really have to use a quantifier in order to state there is no way around them. Uh, so we don't have you know, a formal theorem saying, you know, if you cannot express it without, uh, without a quantifier, we can't do it. But I, I think, you know, at least your method, reality. Uh, hinges on, uh, uh, at least your method hinges on this fact that you need to write it in a finite number of uh, yeah. OK. That, that, that's a pretty satisfying answer for, uh, for, 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 for a user uh, for the moment. Thank you. Thanks. And side note, like what's, what's conceptually confusing to me about is, is like, so I understand, and, and, and towards Ron, you're sort of saying like, we don't know precisely like how to, you know, how to show or like how to make a claim to the form. If you can't write them in this way, then, then you can't extend to independent models. What's conceptually surprising to me is like, I still don't have good intuition like I can, I can look at the examples that show why the lone wolf theorem breaks down and like why, you know, weak Pareto optimality breaks down and so forth. But I don't have good intuition for what precisely is going on. Like I, I don't have a good like general sense of like which properties of matching do not carry over to, to infinite models. Um, and I wish I had a better way to reason about that as well. I guess it, it, the, the one thing though is, is, is this approach that Ron just described at least gives you a way to sort of detect where you might run into problems if we, if we wishfully guess that like this is actually sort of nearly exhaustive. Got it, thank you. Thank you, uh, any other questions? Um, I have to ask one question related to this uh, ongoing discussion. So, so there was this uh, result from a, a previous paper of yours, I mean, related to a model of yours, uh, where 
you get this sepsidan equilibrium using this technique, but then to get variation equilibrium, I, you said you let epsilon go to zero, so I imagine you use uh, usual limits. So, so again, when do you think one, I mean, more intuitively, mm. when one was going to be more useful in the other? Great. Um, so that last limit is, is in some sense like a much simpler limit. It's not a limit in the markets or anything. It's just a limit in the gridding. So we have this, this price grid, we're sort of turning into like an arbitrarily fine finite price grid. And then we just say like, okay, note that because we can prove this for that there exists an approximate price, you know, an approximate equilibrium for an arbitrarily fine price grid that implies for a, you know, the finite price grid or sorry, for the, sorry, the continuous price grid other way. Um, and so in particular, we haven't had to reason about the limit of the model itself or like constructing the price itself as, as a limit from the finite mar market. We just sort of, lifted these approximate prices uh, and observed that we got arbitrarily close. It's a lot, it's sort of um, aesthetically similar to the argument in Kelser Crawford also, where Kelser Crawford gets existence for you know, stable outcomes for continuous prices by proving for every finite, um, you know, sort of price space, uh, you can find stable outcomes. Um, again, there's not, we don't have like a sharp characterization or like a, like a set of like, you know, boundary facets or planes that we could use to sort of define these, you know, sort of when this type of approach applies better or, or, or worse, but at least in my mind, in that, in, in the, the result for wall raising equilibria, logical compactness is sort of doing the complex, it is solving the complexity of figuring out how we get from prices in the finite, you know, equilibrium prices in the finite models to equilibrium prices in the infinite models. And then the limit is just sort of, you know, taking the price grid, you know, sort of showing that the price grid was, was arbitrary. Oh. Yeah. Um, whereas other times we might have to like actually like do things that involve the limits in the you know in the models as well. Ron, do you, so, so, you have more information? So, yeah, on that? No, I, I want to add one more thing, which is you know, in this application of Eurasian equilibrium, we were able to take some limit and and uh, and make things like simpler. Uh, you note that there are more complex things that we deal with in the paper, like a uh, Rennie's generalization of Afriat, uh, where we can't use limits because there are so many price vectors that we cannot use the diagonalization. And there we develop the different techniques that encodes everything into the logic. So in principle, uh, we could have used the same technique that we used in Rennie and, and, uh, and like not need any limits uh, at all also for that proof. It, it would make it slightly more complicated uh, for readers to parse, but, but there, is, there, is, there is a way to write a few more formulas and uh, avoid the need for taking any limits. Slick, I hadn't actually realized that, thank you. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to go and do this as an exercise afterwards. Great, thanks. Uh, so any other questions? Um, maybe, that, maybe one question for me. So I don't know whether you have thought about this. Um, so this existence uh, of equilibria, you know, Fudenberg and Levine, where they show that there exists an equilibrium in every, you know, in dynamic games. So they show if you have in every finite game, mm -hmm. then, uh, and then this is also a sort of an epsilon equilibrium in the infinite game. And then if you have this continuity at infinity, then he saw that there is an, an equilibrium in the, um, in the infinite game. So I was wondering whether you have thought about this and whether this would, you know, whether your method could apply in your... In, so in so I, I missed the very beginning of the question. Which, what's the, who's setting are we in? So this is like, so you have like a, a dynamic game, right? So let's say you have some game perfect equilibria or sequential equilibria, and then you mm -hmm. have existence in every finite game. So, every, you know, finite means, so you always have finitely many people, but let's say finitely many periods. And then, so in every finite game, you have an existence. And then you want to show that you also have existence of the infinite game when T goes to infinity. Yep. And, and the way that, you know, Fudebrain Levine, they, the, the way they, they do it, I mean, there are many papers in, in that, I guess, in that literature is that, you know, they, they choose some kind of uh, topology. So that mm -hmm. they can, so, you know, some kind of continuity. So that you know, if you have an infinite sequence of equilibria, then you have a subsequence that converges there. Yep. But they also need to have this um, assumption of continuity at infinity, which means that if you have two strategies that are identical up to time t, yep. then they can only diverge in terms of utility. Let's say up to some finite number, and this finite number is going to go to zero as t goes to infinity. So distant future doesn't matter 
Um, but you know, in, ev in every finite period, you have an existence. So I don't know whether this could somehow be put in your um, in your framework. This is this is this sounds very very similar to the way yeah. we prove Nash equilibrium with infinitely many players. Uh, so we, we did it. We did you know a toy version of uh, Peleg's result that says that uh, if there are uh, so we we proved that if your utility depends on finitely many players, then there is a Nash equilibrium. But we know how to we just you know to reduce notation. It, it's enough that your utility. Uh, up to epsilon depends. So the, uh, very similar to uh, Fudenberg stuff, you know, uh, the tail only affects an epsilon. And that would basically mean that you can express yeah. your utility up to epsilon depending only on finitely many uh, yeah, exactly. strategies. And that's a finite formula. So at least morally, it sounds like you could do, uh, you could do that using logic. Yeah, that's my prior as well. Anything where like sort of the future tails off or like, you know. It should work, yeah. It should work, yeah. I say anything. That's that's a dangerous statement <laughs> to say on video. I don't, I don't want to claim anything, but we tend to we, we tend to find that this approach works when like sort of the future tails off or when like sort of the distant, you know, at some distance out, like, you know, sort of the impact, you know, goes to zero, like these types of things you can then like, you know, grid same way. It's like, you know, past some point the, the outcome, the impact and the outcome is, is no more than some small amount. And then everything becomes finite because it's, it's within that local ring. Okay, that's great. So uh, I think we're going to finish the official part of um, uh, the talk here. Whoever has any time, you can uh, join us in the um, in the metaverse. So I have I put the link here. I'm going to put it again here. Thanks a lot, and thanks thanks Vito for 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 staying so so late. <laughs> yes, thank you. Past, thank past you. midnight, past I'm one o'clock a.m. <laughs> My pleasure. It's totally.